Uh, so I'm very excited to have our first MIP online speaker as Dr. Ivana Lubich. She's a pre professor of OR at the Essex Business School of Paris, and an expert in combinatorial optimization, optimization and uncertainty, and bi-level optimization. Ivana received her habilitation in OR from University of Vienna, 2013, and she holds a PhD in computer science from the Vienna University of Technology, 2004. Uh, prior to Essex, she was appointed at University of Vienna and held several visiting scholar appointments. Ivana has more than 50 articles in leading OR journals and uses methods of mixed gender linear and nonlinear programming and metaheuristics to successfully solve optimization problems with applications in network design, telecommunications, transportation, logistics, routing, and bioinformatics. Uh, today, her talk is going to be titled Casting Light on the Hidden Bi-Level Combinatorial Structure of the Capacitative Vertex Separator Problem. Hello, Robert. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to my very first online keynote lecture. This is really a great pleasure and a great honor to be first in a row of successful online events that I hope will follow. Uh, well, I am really honored, not only because I believe that this event will help us to, as researchers, improve our image when it comes to the carbon footprint related to our many scientific travels, but also because I believe that this way we will make our research and science more accessible and uh, more approachable to those people who are somewhere around the world who are normally not able to afford to attend uh, faraway conferences like this one. Also, I want to wish a happy birthday to Dan and also to thank again to, to Robert, to Carla, to Yuan, Timo and Yuri for, for, for this opportunity to share the latest results of my research uh, with you. So, I first, I also want to thank to my uh, dear colleagues and co-authors, uh, without whom this uh, work would not have been possible. And these are Fabio Furini, who moved recently from Paris to Rome to CNR, to Enrico Malaguti, who is professor at the University of Bologna, and Paolo Paranuzzi, who, who was at the time when we worked on this problem, PhD student, and now he is a postdoc in Bologna as well. This work is based uh, on the, these two papers, one which we have published last year in mathematical programming computation, and the other one is currently available under optimization online. So today we are going to study two problems, even though I promised you only one problem called the capacity vertex separator problem. Before that, I want to introduce another related uh, and uh, maybe easier to, to understand uh, problem, and maybe it's also more relevant for the current uh, sanitary crisis situation that we are facing. The problem is called the min-max component problem and uh, is given as follows. We are given a graph in which we are looking uh, for a subset of uh, vertices that we want to remove from the graph. We are given a budget of B vertices. And the way how we are removing the, the, graph, the, the vertices should be such that uh, the largest connected component that remains in this graph is the smallest possible. So if I have a budget to remove two vertices, like here on the left, then maybe I can choose the vertex one and two. After that, the largest component will be the one denoted in blue and it will have the size of 24. If I slightly increase the budget and go to the budget of four, then the network deteriorates and then the largest component goes down significantly and it has the size of only 10. So now why is this important and where is the application today? If you imagine that the vertices that we are detecting this way, which are particular critical nodes of the network, uh, are the ones that we can uh, vaccinate in a social network, uh, then if there is a sudden outbreak of a virus in any point in this network, then in, in particular in the situation where we have the budget of four nodes, by vaccinating only four people in the network, this outbreak can reach at most 10 people because only, only at most 10 of them will remain connected and the rest of the network breaks into different components. 
So this problem uh, and uh, many other critical node detection problems have been studied in, uh, uh, in one of the seminal articles in Network Science, uh, which has been published in Nature in 2000 by Albert Barabasi and colleagues, in which they uh, pointed out that in the scale-free networks, indeed, there are some critical nodes that if you break them, then you break significantly the functionality of the network. And in this case, we measure the functionality by the size of the largest component that remains in the graph. So for this problem, uh, Albert Barabasi and colleagues uh, suggested to a greedy heuristic, basically sort all the vertices based on their degrees and then interdict them, remove them one by one until you reach uh, the budget. Uh, in a follow-up paper by Shen and Colesmith and colleagues in 2012, the authors have shown that such greedy heuristic can actually produce arbitrarily bad solutions. And uh, as a response, they provided the first uh, MIP uh, formulation, there is an extended formulation, which can solve this problem exactly. And uh, in the same year, they also studied the problem of trees and proposed a dynamic programming formulation. So this is the first problem that we want to study today. Below, which the problem belongs to the family of critical node detection problems. The other problem, related one, which, which is in the, in the title of my talk, is the capacitated vertex separator problem. Here, the situation is a little bit different. Again, they are given a graph, but now we are given two parameters. We are given uh, number k and number b. And we want to find the smallest subset of vertices that we want to remove from the graph so that the connected components that remain in this graph can be packed into k bins, and the size of each bin is bounded by the parameter b. So, for example, if I am allowed to use two bins of size 17, then it is sufficient to remove these four nodes. But if I enlarge the number of bins, even by reducing their size, then the, with five nodes, I will be able to destroy the graph in such a way that we can pack all the comp connected components into four different bins of each of size 9. So you can observe that uh, isolated nodes, for example, like the green ones, they can be all packed into one bin, whereas here, for example, we have one connected component combined with other isolated nodes and so on. So in addition to, into, not only that we are now looking into the size of the largest component here in the capacity that were separated problem, we also want to pack the components into, uh, into given number of bins. Now, application of this problem is completely different. It comes from the numerical linear algebra and from the MIP decomposition uh, problems, where the vertices of the graph namely correspond to the rows of a linear program. And the two rows are connected, two vertices are connected, but there is a column that shares non-zero entries in two different rows. Now, the, the vertices that we want to remove correspond to the rows that we could eliminate, for example, relax in the Lagrangian fashion. After removing these rows, then we could solve each of the linear programs independently by scheduling them, for example, on K parallel machines. And the parameter B in this case corresponds to the size of these linear programs because in a sense we want that this uh, workload on each machine is somehow balanced. For this problem, which has been introduced in 1998, Borndorf and colleagues have introduced a sophisticated branch and cut approach based on an extended MIP formulation. And very recently, Bas Tube and Lübecke also proposed a branch and price procedure. Okay, so what would be a standard MIP model with which we could solve both these problems? For the rest of my talk, without loss of generality, I will focus on the second problem because it is more general. And you will see that most of the results that you're deriving will also uh, translate easily into the min max component problem. A very natural formulation would be the following one. We could introduce binary variables, xi, i, v, which will be set to one if we assign a vertex to a shore i. Shore is the, uh, the other name that I'm going to use for a bin. And uh, otherwise, if I'm not able to assign a vertex to none of the bins, that means that the vertex has to belong to the separator. 
And now by maximizing the number of assigned nodes, I'm equivalently minimizing the size of the separator. Then the second group of constraints simply guarantees that uh, each vertex can be assigned to at most one bin. And then if the vertex, two vertices are connected by an edge, they cannot be assigned to two different bins. Finally, the size of each bin is bounded by B. So even though this formulation is very uh, simple to understand and uh, easy to implement using an off-the-shelf solver, it suffers from symmetries because clearly any permutation of the indices I and J will give us an equivalent solution. So this is a real nightmare for branch and bound approaches. And the question would be now, and the, second, and the second problem is the size of the model, because we will have the number of bins times the number of vertices variables to deal with. Even though we could slightly strengthen the model of the constraints 1C by replacing the edges by the clicks here, it will not help, will be very helpful in practice. So the question that we were asking ourselves was, how can we derive a canonical formulation for our problem, which would look, work with just with the bare bone uh, uh, variables, which means just with the bina basic binary variables. Is the vertex in the model or not? And how can we make this formulation efficient in practice? So there is, uh, if, if you look closer into the paper of Bondorf and colleagues from 1998, it is very hidden, but it is there. This basic canonical formulation would look like uh, as follows. So as I said, we will need binary variables to state whether the, if we want the vertex to be in the separator or not. We will minimize the size of the separator. And then with the constraints 1C, we will simply say whenever we have a connected component in the graph whose number of vertices is B plus one, we know that at least one of the vertices has to, from this component has to belong to the separator. So this is a kind of a no good constraint. It's not very efficient. There's exponential size. And in addition, if uh, we are imposing to, to pack the components into K, into, into K bins, then we will say the following. Whenever we have a subset of vertices W, we look into the subgraph induced by this subset of vertices and into the connected components of this subgraph. If we can pack the connected components into the K bins of size B, then all is fine. But otherwise, if we need more than K bins, which is the value of the sigma of W function, then again, we know that at least one of the vertices from this subset has to belong to the separator. Now, these cards uh, are called bin packing inequalities. They're empty, hard to separate. And our goal is now to find a formulation uh, to enhance this formulation with additional strengthening families of cuts, for which purpose we are going to look into the bi-level, let's say hidden bi-level structure of these problems. So our, our contribution in a nutshell is the following one. We propose two novel ways of modeling the problem as a stackable game, and by using the lenses with the tools of bi-level optimization, we introduce three new families of cuts, vendor's cuts, component cuts, and degree cuts. And we propose a generic branch and cut framework to efficiently solve this problem in practice. And we show that we are doing so, we are able to uh, computationally outperform state-of-the-art methods available in the literature. Stackelberg games uh, have been uh, introduced back in the 30s in the economics, in the 70s, they became known as uh, bi-level optimization in the mathematical optimization literature. And these are sequential games where we have two players, a leader and a follower. The leader moves first before the follower, and the leader tries to anticipate the res best response of the follower. This is possible because both of the players have the perfect information, which means both of them, them know what are the rules of the game and what are the payoffs. And they act rationally, which means that both of them try to maximize their own objective function. So in the case of our critical node detection problems, we can uh, see this Stackelberg game as follows. Our leader will be the one who is choosing the subset of nodes to delete from the network. And that could be 
possible subsets S1, SK, up to SN. When the leader delete, decides to apply the strategy S1, which means to delete these nodes, then the follower solves another combinatorial optimization problem on the resulting graph. And the follower finds among the all possible discrete solutions, the best uh, possible, the one that maximizes the followers payoff. The leader, because he has the full info or she has the full information, can anticipate the result of the follower, recalculate her payoff, and that way, in theory, the leader could evaluate all possible choices. It would be an exponential number of choices, and then choose the best one, the one that maximizes the leader's payoff. Of course, in practice, we will not apply this double exponential approach. Otherwise, we will actually use the tools of mathematical optimization. So in more general settings, the bi-level optimization can be uh, described uh, using the decision variables x and y. And we say that x are the variables which are controlled by the leader, and y are the variables that come out as a result of another nested optimization problem, which is a parametric problem, which depends on the choices of the leader. So the inner the optimization problem is what we call the followers sub problem. And uh, the functions f and g everywhere here could be convex and non-convex. The problems could be continuous or discrete. Uh, you can imagine many different settings. And the problems are even NP-hard, even when both the leader and the follower sub-problems solve linear programs. What is very, uh, the problems that we are dealing with today, they follow a very specific structure, namely the constraints which are imposed at the follower level, they are not of arbitrary structure. They always look like, like this, which means that remember we use the x variables to state whether the leader is deleting the node or not. So if this happens, then this node will not be available for the follower for her optimization problem. We call these type of problems interdiction-like problems. Very common in the bi-level optimization literature, we will get rid of this inner optimization problem by restating it using what we call a value function problem reformulation. In this case, we will be imposing a constraint which says that the objective function of the follower has to be less or equal than phi of x, where phi of x is the value function which encodes the optimal objective value obtained by solving a parametric problem, the nested sub-followers problem for the given value of x. And so using this value function reformulation, we will now be able to introduce new families of cuts for the problems at hand. So there are, for, for us, we saw two different ways of, see, of seeing the capacity to vertex separate the problem as a stack of their game. The first way is the base, based on the following uh, very simple observation. On the interdicted graph, the size of the largest connected component or of a largest connected component has to be at most b. Otherwise, the choice of the leader, the choice of the vertices to delete will not be feasible. So we can express this uh, as a value function constraint that looks like this. So we simply say phi of x must be less or equal than b where the phi of x now encodes the follower's sub-problem in which the follower, once the edge of the vertices are removed, solves the optimization of problem, which is find the size of the largest connected component in the resulting graph. By doing so, we will be able to derive two types of constraints. One will be the traditional Bender's cuts, and the other ones will be component cuts. Bender scouts will be derived by following this, the LP duality theory, whereas the component cuts will be derived by what we call convexification by penalization. And there is another way of seeing the, our problem as a Stackelberg game. The other way is based on the following observation. If I have a connected graph with n vertices, and if I remove s vertices from this graph, and I want to guarantee that the largest component is at most b in the remaining graph, then I know that the graph has to fall apart into at least k connected components. Okay, So k is n minus s divided by b, rounded up. 
This means that I could now model the problem as the following. I can say the leader is removing the vertices and the follower is subsequently counting the number of components in the remaining graph. And if this number of components in the remaining graph is less than Q, then clearly the solution of the leader is infeasible and can be cut away. In other words, now I'm introducing another value function that they call psi c of x. And I say the following, whenever there is a connected component with more than b vertices, then the number of components, which I count on the left, has to be greater or equal than n, which stands now for the size of the component, minus s, this is the number of vertices that will be removed, divided by b. And these are the cuts that we call the degree cuts. And again, they will be also derived by the convexification, by penalization. So this is the major, the major contribution of our work. And I see that I'm actually uh, running a lot of time. OK, so I have to speed up a little bit. So another advantage of looking into the very function reformulation in this case is that it will help us to derive uh, uh, canonical presentations by Bender's like decomposition. Because if we are able to co convexify the value function using linear functions, then there will be no y variables, no variables describing the follower subproblem. For the min max component problem, if the function phi simply counts the, the size of the largest component, this is done by this reformulation, simple reformulation. Whereas the, for the capacity to vertex separator problem, we will simply say we minimize the size of the, of the separator. We have all the constraints, x and x, including the bin packing and so on. And in addition, we ensure that each component is of size at most b. So how to convexify the value function constraints? The component cuts are the ones that uh, I will show you first. Remember, the function phi of x counts the number of components in the largest, the, the size of the largest component in the interdicted graph. For that purpose, we could use this linear uh, integer linear program in which we use the binary variable 0, 1, in which we say, OK, uh, if the vertex u and the vertex v are included in the solution, then also then any known separator that separates u from v also have to contain uh, from the, each node separate, at least one vertex have to be taken. However, when the vertex is interdicted by the leader, it cannot belong to the separator. The problem with this uh, formulation is that this is an integer program. We cannot use LP duality. We cannot use KKT conditions to use the standard methods of the bi-level optimization to reformulate the, the value function. I can also rewrite it, but simply stating that the y's are the binary vectors satisfying a certain combinatorial structure. So in 2011, Wood proposed the, 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 the following trick, which I call convexification by penalization, and uh, which is based on this observation. Basically, the product between x and y variables has to be always equal to 0, which means that instead of working with the, the constraints 1b, we can simply uh, introduce penalization term into objective function, put some big M co coefficients so that we make sure that the optimal solution of the original problem will be also optimal for this reformulation. If we are able to find the appropriate big M's, then optimizing optimization problem doesn't depend, the, the, the physical space doesn't depend on X anymore. And so we can maximize over the convex half of all combinatorial solutions. And that gives us the convexification of the original value function constraint. We will impose for any extreme point uh, y, we will impose one of these constraints. And therefore, uh, that will give us a valid uh, reformulation. So that would be our way towards component cuts. But of course, the major challenge here would be how can we find the proper, the proper uh, constraints m here, the, the proper coefficients here, and in particular, how can we find the tight coefficients? Because by putting an arbitrary big, big m values here will actually result in very weak cuts. So we want to find the tightest possible constraints. What we knew from the literature was is the following. We know how to deal with these big M constraints if the follower is solving a linear problem. We know how to deal with them if we have an integer program which satisfies certain downward monotonicity constraints, or when we are solving a problem with uh, edge or vertex hereditary properties. 
But for the problem in hand that I have just introduced before, we actually don't know how to derive big M constraints, big, big M coefficients. So here I'm giving you an illustration of what happens. Imagine that we are giving a tree, and the, the, in this tree we have nine vertices. So the, if I do not interdict any vertex, then the maximum value of the solution will be simply nine. However, if I interdict the vertex V, then the graph will separate into three components and the size of the largest connected component that remains will be of size five. This means that the coefficient m somehow have to make a correction that the, if, the, if I interpret this vertex, I have to correct the original value of the objective function. And in this case, this means the, the maximum size of the component minus the size of the largest component that remains. And indeed, we can prove that these coefficients are the, the lower bound for the M, and not only that, they are also resulting in a feasible problem reformulation, and these are the cuts that we call the component cuts. Okay, separation of these constraints is based on the breadth-first search method, so that they can be separated in polynomial time. And then I promised you also Bender's cuts. You may wonder, for example, you would say, why are we actually modeling a follower sub-problem, which is simply count the number, the, the number of vertices in the largest component? This is a polynomial time problem. Why do I use a sledgehammer to crack a nut when I know that I can use a linear program to solve this problem? And yes, we can indeed do that. And then a linear program now is an extended formulation. So you see that it works with a larger number of variables. Here, the X star stands for the interdiction of the vertices at the leader level. And the sigma VL variables now model the fact, the fact that e, the vertices V and L will be in the same connected component. So we say that the vertex is in the same component with itself. And then we propagate the connectivity and say if W and L, W is the same component with L, then if the none of the two end vertices is interdicted, then also V will be in the same component as L. And uh, the summation on the right-hand side, side of 1V is now giving us the size of the connected component, which is rooted at L. And that way, we can, by minimizing it, find the largest component in the interdicted graph. So phi, so this linear program actually defines a, a function phi of X star, which is a convex function which means that uh, by applying the LP duality theory, we can we obtain a Bender's... I'm sorry. <clears throat> we can obtain a Bender's reformulation of the problem. And we can impose these cuts for any tree, uh, for any connected component, which is larger than B. And we can again separate these cuts using a combinatorial breadth research based separation procedure, which I'm not showing you uh, now for the sake of saving the time. And finally, uh, just very quickly, the second way of looking into this problem as a Stackelberg game is given by modeling the follower sub problem as a problem of counting the number of components in the remaining graph. For that purpose, we use another graph theoretical property. We say we know that the graph has at least Q components, if and only if any maximum cycle-free subgraph contains at most V minus Q edges. Here is an illustration. So if you have a graph with nine vertices, like here, and the graph has uh, three components, then the maximum number of edges that we can put into any cycle-free subgraph will be nine minus three, which is six. So we can model now the follower subproblem as the problem of counting the number of edges in the cycle-free, maximizing the number of edges in the cycle-free subgraph on the interdicted graph. I'm skipping the formulation. And I'm just telling you that in this case, we are again using the, the convexification by penalization, in which case now we can exploit the edge hereditary property. And that way we obtain the cuts that look like this. Again, they are will be posed for any connected component, which is larger than B, and for any spanning subtree of this component. So to summarize, again, the separation will work based on the breadth-first search. Uh, uh, tree calculation. 
to summarize, there are three different types of cuts. All of them are imposed for any given connected component with more than C, uh, B vertices. All of them have the same right-hand side, but the coefficients in these cuts are different. So I mean, the question arises, uh, what is the relation between these cuts? First, we observe that we can apply the tightening because we have binary variables. The coefficients are non-negative, both on the left and right-hand side. And after tightening, it turns out that the Bender's cuts are dominated by the component cuts. So this is now the answer to your question, maybe. Why did we use the sledgehammer? Remember, the sledgehammer was we were using an integer programming formulation rather than the linear programming formulation to derive these constraints. Whereas for the degree cuts, we have, we have no relationship between them, so they are in, the cuts are incomparable. When it comes to computations, we have uh, tested our approach on almost 1,400 different instances, and they have been derived from the, the test bed, which has been recently used by Bastug and Lubeke. These are the instances from the NetLib, uh, representing linear programs, uh, instances from the DIMAX challenge and graph coloring from the MIPLIP. These are the pre solved MIPs from the MIPLIP 2010. And randomly generate, generated hypergraphs, uh, which we, we had to turn each hyper edge into a click to make it the uh, 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 instance and graphs. Uh, for the K, which was the number of bins, we considered these uh, different values. And so these are the small, medium, and large values. And the size of each bin was set following this formula, just like in the paper from 2019. So here are our first results. First, we were looking into the effects of the component versus degree cuts versus Bender's cuts. And uh, what was surprising was that even though the Bender's cuts were not comparable with the degree cuts, they were actually performing quite well in practice. They were solving 870 instances in total. But the best performer, which is not surprising, were the component cuts. So 925 instances solved in total, and uh, the average time was actually less than one minute. With quite some number of uh, branch and bound nodes used, which is can be explained by the fact that uh, we were separating integer points only. And the best, uh, we also did a lot of experiment design, combined many different cuts and so on. And we figured out that the best branch and cut setting was by combining the component cuts with the cover inequalities introduced by born Dörfer, which was allowing us to solve 940 instances in total and reduce the number of branching nodes a little bit. Then we also compared our approach with the state of the art, which is the branch and price uh, from Bastug and Lubeke, and also with the symmetric formulation of CPLEX. I'm showing you here the results aggregated over all instances, the performance profiles for the large and small values of K. And what you can see is that when K is large, which means that we have many bins, but each of them with a relatively small size, then our method outperforms uh, the others, and CPLEX is here at, at the bottom. So CPLEX really struggles a lot when we have a lot of bins, which is also not only reflected by the symmetry, but also by the size of the MIP model. On the contrary, CPLEX uh, does quite well for some of the instances when K is very small. I will skip this. So uh, this is the comp comparison with respect to different uh, classes of instances. You can just see here that we are outperforming all three methods for different classes, except for the class of randomly generated instances, where branch and price seems to be uh, a bit faster than us. When it comes to the min-max uh, problem that I have introduced at the beginning, you can see that here we are comparing, again, the same CPLEX formulation against the model which has been in state-of-the-art model which has been introduced in 2012. And you can see, again, that we solve a significantly large number of instances with our component cuts based branch and cut. So to conclude, Bi-level optimization in general is very difficult. However, I was just showcasing you two graph theory problems belonging to the family of node deletion problems that could be efficiently solved if we look into these problems from the bi-level perspective, if you look, you look into them through bi-level lenses. In particular, this is true because we are 
exploiting the, the thin models, which means canonical formulations, and the Bender's like decomposition, which allows us to beat the state of the art. What would be the interesting future directions from the future research? Well, it would be fine if we could exploit similar ideas for some problems where the follower subproblems are maybe nonlinear but convex, or if they have to deal with some uh, submodular objective functions, or even maybe, maybe we could extend these ideas to optimization. Uh, by level or let's say optimization problem under uncertainty where the follower sub problem is uh, uh, stochastic. And finally, extension to three level games would be another interesting direction for future research. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope we still have time for a few questions.